So fear busting is actually looking at what is your deepest, darkest fear and realizing that there's only one component, one hurdle between fear and freedom. Welcome to the Side Hustle Lounge. If you're looking for flexible ways to earn income, grow your mindset and live the lifestyle you've always dreamed of, you're in the right place. So lower the lights, grab your favorite beverage and join your host, founder of NotaryCoach.com and Amazon best-selling author of Sign and Thrive, How to Make Six Figures as a Mobile Notary and Loan Signing Agent, Bill Soroka. All right, cheers and welcome to my next guest today, Frederick Meyer, otherwise known as Dr. Fred or just Fred. Fred, thank you so much for making the time with us today. Hey, glad to be here. Um, my dad called me, he called our family mayor, um, just to kind of get that clarified. Because when I'm out on the West Coast and I get introduced as Fred Meyer, people think that I own the stores. And so um, uh, I actually had to change my name when I went out West. You know, a lot of people change their name when they go out West from John to Sunflower. Okay. But I, I went the other way. I went from Fred to Frederick. And so I could say my name was Frederick Mayer. And that delayed the Fred Meyer joke by about 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I didn't go there. They totally misread your pronunciation here, too. I thought it was the way around. Those are not your stores, but that's exactly where my head went. It was Fred well, they Meyer. Are my stores. Yeah, they are my stores. Come, you know, we take all forms of, uh, you know, cre- you know, anything, cash, uh, check, credit card, uh, Bitcoin, you name it. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, take your money. I love it. I love it. Well, I love your bio too. I can tell you're um, a man of many passions uh, and I'm excited to share those with our audience today. To kick us off, I'd just like to know, you know, uh, what your side hustles are right now or today. Okay. Yeah. My side hustles right now are, um, have to do in basically two main arenas. Um, the, the musical arena and, as far as you can expand with that. And then the ag agricultural arena, which again is totally expansive and open-ended. So um, actually um, my side hustles involve um, doing a thing called garden coach, where I parlayed my skills. I owned an organic farm, a production farm for about 11 years. And I've worked on a lot of different farms. Um, So I parlay my, my, um, organic gardening, organic farming skills into backyard gardening and homestead gardening, where I help uh, homesteaders and backyard gardeners green up their thumbs and boost their yields. Okay. So that's one of my arenas. Um, and so I, my garden coach thing has me actually on retainer right now uh, with a, a young group of homesteaders um, who also happen to be the offspring of those parents happen to be my violin students. So that's where the whole thing has actually has emerged. Um, The other side hustle has to do with anything musical that I can do, making arrangements. I play a lot of weddings. uh, I teach. Um, My core thing for years and years uh, was to be a public school music teacher, uh, conducting bands, orchestra choirs, general music theory, um, instrument building and things like that. So basically my side hustles have, have, um, I've been in those two arenas and um, I've found all kinds of ways to connect with people and actually be of service to help them fulfill what it is that they want in their lives. And so the side hustle for me is actually part about making some, some money and, and big part about being of service to, um, to help people out and um, to raise a vibe and, and help humanity and, especially young people and to teach. So that's, that's what's going on right now. Yeah. Well, I love that. And with these two particular fields, let's go back to the homesteading because that is, there's a a huge popular trend happening right now with homesteading. There's even a, 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 I don't know if it's on HDTV or it's on television where they're going in and doing these homesteading. And then this crew comes in and helps them save their homestead whenever things aren't going according to plan. And a lot of it has to do with their gardening. So what's the passion behind uh, these homesteading and gardening? Yeah, I, I, I think you, food. 
Yeah, you growing your own food. Well, <clears throat> over the last several decades, we have been sort of wooed and coerced into believing that everything is going to be taken care of. And now people are realizing that um, maybe that's not going to happen <laughs> or it's not going to happen in the way that, that has been said. And so uh, in the process of this wooing, we have let go of our personal responsibilities to take care of ourselves and take care of, of people and things around us. For example, um, we always thought that if we got sick, we could always just take a pill and boom, everything would be fine. Um, but now it's becoming clearer that we need to take more, pay more attention to ourselves and our bodies. So I think that um, the that trend, as you're referring to, has to do with people stepping back and saying, "I'm going to, I'm going to grow my own food. I'm going to grow my own medicine, and whatever uh, I have is overage. I'm going to share, and maybe I got more something than somebody else does." And and so then that whole exchange thing uh, becomes very neighborly. And helps uh, knit folks together and, and help them feel connected. Um, one of the things that when I was running my farm and I uh, that I was such a, a big benefit was the feeling of total connection. I felt connected with the seasons. I connect felt connected, felt connected with the land. I had great Pyrenees dogs who once that I literally bought the farm. I bought the farm bill, okay, and I, that came with dogs, chickens, barns, stuff falling down. Stuff having to be, I mean, I spent so much money and so much time, but what, what I ended up with was a complete peace of mind that I feel completely in the flow of nature and completely in the flow of the forces that are supporting me and that I'm helping to support. And um, I, I think that anybody who gets even a taste of that, it's kind of like you don't want to go back or you want to always have some piece of that connection going on. Cause, um, that makes us feel alive and um, and uh, it, it connects us back to all the sources that we need to uh, to pay attention to. Yeah, that's um, anyway, go ahead. that's interesting. I think there's a for many of us, especially for me, that connection to nature uh, is something I crave and I don't even realize I'm craving it until I uh, I reach a certain threshold and then I go for a walk in the forest or out and just out on a drive even uh, through the nature and it can reconnect. So having that level of connection with the four seasons, that really spoke to me as you said that, because out here in the desert, sometimes we forget there are four seasons, Yeah, but I'm really curious how you, how you even decided to buy a farm. How'd you get, where'd that come from? So um, after 27 years of public school teaching, um, um, I stepped off the podium I stepped down from that, uh, literally built my dream house on a canal in Southwest Florida, you know, pool in the backyard, um, canal in the back, boat lift, you know, a little runabout in the mangroves, catch fish. You know, I was working every tide to my advantage. Tide go out. I go out in the riprap and pick up shrimp, uh, anything, you know, uh, shrimp and and. and little pieces of uh, whatever would, would, would bait up. And then the tide would come in and I'd go f fishing out in my canal and catch, you know, um, sheep's had dinner for four, whenever I wanted to. Okay. So I had that, but then the area around me in Southwest Florida, this was in the, um, the about 0, 04, 05, 06 was becoming so overly developed so fast, so uncontrollably. And, Florida is a wonderful place, but it feels unsustainable and it's proving to be unsustainable, but nobody, mm. not everybody's waking up to that yet. So I was sitting in, it was in my, my dream house and I had a great routine where, uh, of, um, of exercise, meditation, all that stuff. And I was sitting and this thought that came to me says, you're going to be going to Northwest <laughs> Arkansas. Excuse me? I'm going, really? So, yeah. So I, I came out of my, my little office, my little space. I said, "Hun, we're going to be going Northwest Arkansas. Well, uh, let's find out where it is. <laughs> I've never been there. Um, and, and so the whole journey was um, a component of uh, what drives me, which I call fear busting. So fear busting is actually looking at 
what is your deepest, darkest fear and realizing that there's only one component, one hurdle between fear and freedom. And so what happened was we caught a flight and went up and took took a look at Northwest Arkansas and decided that we could probably make a go of it there because I wanted to learn how to grow my own food. I wanted to be more sustainable. I wanted to be able to, I want to be able to take better care of myself and not be in a situation where I was um, at, at the mercy of uh, some factors yeah. that were under out of my control. You didn't want to rely on a Fred Meyer it's grocery store control. for your sustainability, right? No, no. Or, or any of the other <laughs> grocery chains that are there for that matter. So yeah, exactly. So, so, um, I went there and we just bought a little toehold place because the farm really wasn't on the market yet. And, um, so I put my house on the, on the market in, um, Florida. And right when I did that, the housing market started to crash. And so instead of turning my house over in literally two weeks, um, just the delay of, uh, of, of a few weeks at that time, I was nine oh, wow. months sitting on my property. And so, I was, so I had a house that was in Florida and I had a house that was up in Eureka Springs. I was like, ah. so at some point something had to give. So they both went on the market and they both sold within two weeks of each other. So I was going to be homeless with a whole bucket of money. Right. So as it turned out, the farm came on the market that time we bought that. And um, then I began to, to work with the land there. He began to talk to me. And I also um, apprenticed with a very, very fine, um, organic farmer, a French organic farmer who was in the area, who was sort of like the premier organic farmer of the area. And so I was his boy Friday for a year and a half. Okay. So, you know, I went there and, and worked and got my veggies and brought the beer and we all had lunch together. Um, and, but at the same time I was working uh, for Patrice, um, I had my own lab, right? I had my own property. And so I could begin to apply and adapt whatever was going on there to the situation that I was in. And things are always different depending on, you know, everybody's piece of ground is a little different. So you have to adapt to that. And so um, then I began to um, modify my, uh, my growing and, and techniques uh, based on what Patrice had shown me that applied better to my piece of ground. And um, over a couple of years, I started getting productive enough and I had chickens at 150 laying hens. I had a table leg business and all the chicken manure from that for composting. Plus I had these veggie patches that I evolved and then we grew some uh, ginseng and we grew comfrey and we grew lavender, we grew, uh, things that we could actually make products from at the same time that were healthful for us right. because we needed the products. Okay. For our better health. So that was how that all came about. And, um, I had great help, um, you know, putting the farm together since I had some cash, I could, I could pay labor to help me get things established. People who go in without the resources to do this is very, very difficult. Or, you know, they're relying on volunteers or whatever, you know, um, the only way to, to make a million is to go in at least with two, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, yeah, I've heard that before. So true. And then. Well, what, at what point did you decide to let go of the farm or did you sell it or just move on to something new? How'd that look? Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, I've been married for over 40 years. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend that to everybody <laughs> or anybody for that matter. But anyway, I've been married for over 40 years. It's great. Uh, and my wife is very, very sensitive to, um, uh, allergens and things like that. The area that we were in did have some industrial chicken farming. And so when they would, and, and the way that people in the Ozarks, I mean, the ground in the Ozarks is nothing but rock and clay, basically. Okay. You got to make your own soil. Me and the good Lord and a lot of good uh, inputs help me to actually build soil on my farm. So the way that, 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 uh, the the mid-size ag works there is people who have these huge chicken houses and chicken farms also run cattle. So they take the chicken litter and they spread it on their fields to fertilize the hay. And so when that happens, all all that is in the air and everybody's coughing and it's they call yeah. it chicken lung up here. Okay. And and so it's not a good thing. And so um that was not good for her. And so we said, you know, let's sell the farm. And it took us a while to sell the farm. 
Uh, and then we moved out to Oregon where my kids were. Uh, my kids and grandkids had all relocated and were out there for a few years. And so then I experienced a whole nother level of farming, you know, which is basically all about cannabis, just probably like it is in, in Colorado. The main ag there is, is cannabis in Southern Oregon. So, um, uh, it was very interesting to take the, the, um, my organic farming skills to the cannabis farm because basically I had to leave everything at the door, at the gate, I should say, yeah. because what they do is, is, Complete, and then I picked up those skills and say, well, how do those also work in the garden? So yeah, yeah it's just a com- continuous cross fertilization of um, picking up knowledge here and there and applying it to wherever you happen to be landing. You know, wherever you are on the planet. Yeah, yeah, you got to bring all that stuff with you and intertwine it. I love that. So now you have the garden coach, yeah, business, the garden coach. So um, I just have a little three quarters of an acre on just sloping land. Most of the stuff in the Ozarks is like pretty straight up or straight down, you know, they sell a lot of lots like that too. I don't know who's buying them, but somebody's buying them. So, um, so yeah, so I set up my own little grow um, for veggies um, up on a deck because there's a lot of deer and there's a lot of rocks. So I just grow in, uh, I'm doing mainly container gardening right now. Although I am putting in a plot actually today, and when we're done with our interview, I've got a kid who's coming. He's working with me on, on a terrace. Uh, and so there's another area that I'm going to, that's already cleared. So I don't have to, you know, I don't have to do that piece of it. And uh, I'm more interested now, in a thing called a restorative agriculture, which um, has to do with using and, uh, and planting more perennials to, for our food, uh, for our food supply simply because um, there's just less inputs once they're established and they establish for much longer. So rather than having to plant something every year, um, once you get established, then for the next uh, 75 to 200 years, your uh, plants are sustaining you. Wow. You know, what's really coming through, Fred, as you talk, is I can tell you're really passionate about this. I wonder if you can answer a question for our audience here is when choosing a side hustle, because you've had a lot, through the years. And I want to talk about that here in a minute, but what do you think is more important having passion for it or it turning a profit? Uh, the passion will turn a profit. <laughs> so yeah, it, uh, love what you're doing and, and make sure that whatever you're doing is a, a, a service to, to everybody. You know, there's, there's a, <clears throat> there's a famous financial guy who kind of sums it up. Have you ever heard of um, Robert Kiyosaki? He wrote um, absolutely. Yeah. You know Robert Kiyosaki. Okay, you know um, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Poor Dad Rich Dad, whatever it is. Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. Okay, so he has um, and I I kind of keep this like candy so I can refer to it every now and then. So his number one thing, uh, at the top of his ten steps to awaken your financial genius, <laughs> number one is find a reason greater than reality, the power of spirit, a rate, a reason or purpose is a combination of wants and don't wants. And so, you know, that to me speaks to passion and, and, and do something that you really enjoy doing and make it of service. Don't worry about making money at it because if you love doing it, you know, you're going to do a good job and that's going to speak for itself. You know, you don't have to worry about the front end, the back end, just do your part to share the best that you can with people and that will be enough. And that will multiply a hundredfold, a thousandfold, 10,000 fold. Did you, um, do you feel like you kind of inherently knew that when you first started out in your career and your side hustles, or was that a learned lesson? No, I think it was a learned lesson. My first side hustle was when I was seven years old and I was selling seed packets and here I am, I'm spiraling around, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, went from selling seed packets and, and consulting with um, um, an herbologist. Because I, I thought I was going to be an MD when I grew up. Because my dad was an MD. Hmm. And I was on that track. So um, my first side hustles, are, always our first side hustles are to get some cash. Because um, you're looking to create some extra uh, income to buy something in, in particular that you really want. So um, that's why my first side hustle was to um, to sell seed packets. <laughs> okay, it looked, it looked like a good thing to do. I made a little bit of money, but I, you know, made a lot of friends too, and met a lot of people and saw some situations. And the more that you can see, then the more that you can expand. 
So, um, uh, in, in, in a lot of different realms. So anyway, so that's how that got started. And, um, another side hustle, um, that, that, that came about in the music business had to do with, uh, when I lived in Alaska, I lived in Alaska for 10 years. I went up there as a, oh, um, a cook on a tug. All right. So I had worked, I had worked as a cook on a work crew before. And then I also worked tugs and barges and this is different places along the West coast. And then, um, so I needed to cook for a tug. So I had all the experience for that. And the tug was owned by a sawmill and the sawmill, uh, was in this rem- really remote area, huge sawmill, state of the art, where the, the, the lumber ships from Asia came to our dock to get loaded. And so the mill did primary processing so that the job stayed in the U S at least part of the job stayed, so they didn't ship logs. Um, but anyway, then, uh, growing up as a kid playing violin, I knew that there was certain wood that went into the violin. For example, the sides back and neck are made out of maple, typically, you know, traditionally. Uh, there's an ebony fingerboard and pegs. And then on the top is spruce. And Southeast Alaska has the finest Sitka spruce in the world. And I was sitting in the middle of it. So I began to put two and two together that this spruce is something that instrument makers needed. And so, um, I was fascinated by, by spruce. I loved spruce. I went crazy on spruce. I love red cedar, yellow cedar. You know, I love some, all those woods. So the whole wood thing became a side hustle because I was teaching six, seven, eight hours a day. And then I created, I found a, um, I, I found a supply and a scam that I could, um, take advantage of. That was mutually benefited uh, everybody. And I found a source of spruce logs that had already been cut that had been used for a bridge and the way they build bridges for logging roads. I was living in a logging camp later on. I, I taught music at a logging camp. That's a great place to start. Yeah. Is they put these spruce logs across the creek. You know, they put a head log parallel to the stream bed and then they put six or eight or 10 of these spruce logs across the creek and they strap it together with three quarter inch cable and big staples, six inches of crushed rock. And that's a bridge. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when they get done with that area, then, um, uh, they're going to pull that bridge. They're going to water bar, bar that area to prevent people from going out there and, you know, getting into something that, that maybe they don't need to get into or whatever. Or if they like that road and they're going to use it, then they'll upgrade it with either another log bridge or a steel bridge. So all this material that's the best spruce logs you can find in the area that have already been cut, dragged to the site, are piled on the side of the road, and nobody wants them because they're mm-hmm. full of rock and they're full of staples. Okay? So nobody's going to run them through a traditional mill. Well, what I discovered is that you could actually cut this into sections, split them open by hand, and see what the grain and the characteristics of the spruce look like and to find out whether they would be useful to instrument makers. Well, since nobody wanted that wood, the Forest Service said, yeah, I mean, tell us which ones you want and we'll scale it out. So basically, I was buying the wood in the round for $40 a 1,000 board feet, and I was selling it for $4,000 $4,000 per board feet once I had processed it. So if it didn't make into a bass top, it might make into a cello. If not a cello, it would make into a guitar. Not a guitar, a viola. If not a viola, then maybe it would make into a violin. And if not a violin, maybe there was, you know, wood for bracing that you they need to brace guitars. And, and if not that, then the knots heated my house. So there was no waste. Right. So brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, and then I was shipping that out of a logging camp and it all had to go through on the airplane to get to the post office and then ship all over the U S and all over the world. Wow. So for splitting wood two hours a day, I was equaling my teaching salary just because I found a really high quality in demand product that was abundant in my area. And then I had to figure out how to process it the way that the, the, the makers wanted it. And It took one trip. My first trip, I had these really totally random, not knowing what in the world it was, samples of spruce that were resident. You know, you could hold them, ding, 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 they would ring. I knew it was good wood. And always my side hustle, somebody has said, 
has taken me under their wing and said, do you want me to show you exactly what product we want this to look like? I said, sure. He says, can I, can I whack away on this piece right here? I said, yeah. So he got a chisel, put it put it in a certain, put it in a pie shape like that where the grains running across just got up. He says, this is how we want it. Boom. That was all I needed. Yeah. And after that, I was selling thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of spruce. And I was building a boat. I bought a boat when I was in this logging camp. It was a steel vessel, a 30 foot steel vessel with a hull and an engine. And so I needed, <laughs> I needed some cash to be able to build the boat. So yeah. that's how that worked out. And then I became like a boat right after that. <laughs> Talk about connecting some dots, Fred. I love it. Uh, and you're recognizing opportunities. And I think that's, really the um in an abundant universe as such we live there's opportunity everywhere when you can recognize it through that the um you you kind of led me to my next question though because you've been a teacher for 27 years and i've known a few teachers my grandfather was a teacher for 30 years and didn't necessarily was not in a position to buy his dream home or build his dream home in florida so my question for you is did all these side hustles that seem to almost interconnect. And I love your idea of the spiral that spiraled up for you. Did that help you build your dream lifestyle later on down the road for retirement or semi-retirement, whatever you might call it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Directly and indirectly, they probably did. Um, Actually, I know that they did because um, the side hustle in Alaska with the wood actually went into a boat and then I traded the boat, even Stevens for land. So I still own lots up in Alaska, but I'm really probably not got, so I'm actually, I'm going to gift that to my grandson. So it kind of helps somebody's lifestyle. And let me see you the other side. Hustles. Well, the other side hustles. Yeah. They pay the bills. They pay some bills. Um, Cause I play a lot, a lot of weddings and um, I still do a lot of teaching. So my public school teaching was 27 years. Um, that, that, like I said, ended in 04. So now I'm 18 years side hustling on the music side, you know, which is basically just an independent contractor or freelancer. So I'm not connected with an institution, which is the traditional way to make music, uh, money in music. At least has been for about five or 600 years until the last 20 or 30 and things are evolving in a different way. Yeah. So is yeah, that the whole question? I'm not sure if it does or not. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it um, definitely got there, and I love. Thank you for showing the the path. You know, the uh, the wood paid for the boat, the boat got you land, and you just keep moving up from there. So that was that was awesome. And but before we wrap this conversation up, Fred, I want to go back to your fear busting strategy. I oh, yeah. think. I'd like to dive a little deeper into this and how, what is your fear busting strategy? Can we, is it tactile? Can we tell people how you do this and what they can do to get over fear? Absolutely. When you look at what your most mm, daunting fear is at any given moment and what is really stopping you, think of it as an onion with many, many layers to peel off. And at the core is like, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen? Okay, that's it in a nutshell. Um, My first fear busting was when I was um, a late teenager and my greatest fear was, oh my God, if my car breaks down, I don't know anything about cars. How am I gonna, you know, how am I? And so, what I did was I discovered that there was one thing that was preventing me from mechanicking and learning about my car. And that is I accidentally one day got my hands really, really, really dirty. And I realized the reason I wasn't mechanicking is because I didn't want to get dirty hands. And then I discovered goop. And then I was, I was pulling the head off and I was changing it, you know, a clutch by the side of the road, you know, and, and I was listening to car talk and guessing stuff before they did. So, you know, it's just you find one thing. And then another fear busting thing that happened to me was, um, well, of course, the farm thing and just facing that. OK, well, what is it that that I, I'm definitely, definitely afraid that maybe I won't have enough to eat and I'll starve. To death. Well, you know, one step. Well, what do you got to do? Well, you got to get a place 
and somebody that, you know, and the motivation to help you get going. And I met with uh, Patrice. And then another fear busting thing that happened to me, this is probably the most pivotal one. When I was up in Alaska, there was a fishing hole out in Clarence Straits. I lived on Prince of Wales Island, which is a large island in Southeast Alaska. And you could only fish this place when the winds blew from the north. Okay, this is a large channel where the, the winds either blew from the south or they blew from the north. And 85% of the time they were blowing from the south. So when it was north, when there was a north wind and it was favorable to go out, I would go to this fishing hole. And the cool thing about this fishing hole is that you would you go, I, I had it triangulated and, and you would drop your bait down and then you, you're drifting across it with the wind and then you bring it up and then you drop it down again and you go another two or three fathoms and you pick it up again and keep doing this. And then you get to the bottom. As soon as you got to the bottom, there was a fish on. You just reel it up. It's a great big, huge ass red snapper, you know, and you just reel it up and then you motor up and you get on the north side and you just drift over. You can do that all day long. Well, it started to get kind of choppy one day. So I said, well, I better dive into the cove that's close by. I knew the area. So I went to this cove and just changed my fishing gear. And so I'm in a 15 foot wooden skiff and I look out my skiff and I see this circling my skiff, a huge dorsal fin. I'm going, mm. holy moly, I'm about to be shark lunch. And so, uh, I kind of got myself calmed down. I looked around and saw what I had in my boat. So I had an oar and I had a huge hunting knife and I had some line. I just lashed the, I lashed the, the, the knife on the end of the oar. So now I had a harpoon at the moment that I went from being the prey to being the predator. My fear evaporated. I took hmm. one step. Okay. And most fear that I have discovered is one step away from freedom. And you just have to identify that step and move right into it. Excellent. Fred. Excellent advice and great story too. <laughs> so, fin and did the shark leave you alone or? Oh, oh yeah. So here's the, oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't need to. I'm on the edge of my seat. So <laughs> the, the shark. I'm the 15 foot skiff, and it's like a 17 foot shark. Well, oh, I, I'm standing up in the boat with my harpoon. I look over. I see the markings on the shark, and um, it's a uh, it's a basking shark, and they're vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> and he just kind of meandered off later, but it was there. The shark medicine was there to teach me about that conversion from fear to freedom. Yes. Oh, I love that. The difference between fear and freedom is often just one step. Fred, I'm, uh, I'm also compelled to ask you another question too, because I'm fascinated with the voices that we hear uh, sometimes throughout life. And being able to determine, is that your instinct? Is that something spiritual happening? Is that your fear talking? They often have the same tone. They sound the same. So when you were, when you heard that voice to tell you that you're going to Northwest Arkansas, what do you think that was? Oh, well, I'm pretty certain. Um, I know what it was. Um, at different stages of, uh, my meditation practice, which continues, we deploy different techniques to get um, answers. Okay. Basically, what we want to do, all of the metaphysical, all of the spiritual, all the religious, everything that deals with the spirit of humanity is focused on helping us try and make the next best step. All right. I mean, you know, I think failure is definitely overrated if you can find success. So, um, so at that time, my practice was one that evolved to, um, a place where, uh, I could ask or be open to receive. And then you sit back and listen. I think that's a pretty common, uh, meditation technique. So that was the way I was doing that. Now I, it's very different now. Okay. But that's how I was doing it then was um, mm -hmm. that kind of a meditation technique where um, you could just relax, open up and begin to listen to um, uh, those kinds of um, notions that come into you. And and th that is just an element of continuing to connect with your own divinity. You know, we're, we're really divine beings that are walking around in a meat suit. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. In my opinion. Uh, it, not bodies trying to, you know, take on some kind of spirit. The spirit's already there. So it's just a matter of um, finding ways that you can personally connect with that. 
and um, have it be meaningful and trust it and have faith, which gives you, you know, confidence and strength and victory in every step of your, your, uh, your life. Hmm. It's beautiful. So when it comes to that experience in particular, Northwest Arkansas, was there, do you think a, a lesson that you were to del- to learn or to deliver to someone else? Do you think there was that kind of connection or was it just up on whatever is coming next for you? Um, let me answer that question with a question. So, Bill, are there places that you have been on the planet and like, and for example, where you're living now that you feel right in being there? Where are the places that have been there for you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Even beyond cities um, and just drilling down to actual homes, I think they've filled some sort of purpose for sure. Um if not for me, for someone else, that chance connection that happened, that person that I met, this opportunity that presented itself in those situations. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's important for people to um, feel and realize that there are places on the planet that work for them for any given amount of time, might be for a day, for a year, for a lifetime, where everything that they need, uh, comes more easily. Mm. And I ha- I was on a mission when I got here. I was on my fear busting mission when I got here. And it turns out um, what I needed from the area here and what the people who were in this area needed from me uh, seemed to be a pretty good match, mm. good fit. And it continued yeah. to be. And when I was out for the four years in, in, um, in Oregon and then later in Florida before I came back here, People started calling me from up here. I started getting work up here. It's like, I don't live here anymore. And finally, I got convinced. I mean, when something happens once, you know, I just kind of make note of it. It happens twice. I really start paying attention. And yeah. um, and so I got contacted by these homesteaders to teach their kids violin. And I, and it, I was not wanting to do things by uh, by zoom, like zoom lessons as much. I'd had some zoom lesson experience and it wasn't really that great. And then I started taking a class, a violin class and the guy did it by zoom and said, Oh, and he, it was a three level class. It's like, okay, I'm teaching you violin and jazz technique and, you know, these tunes. And I'm teaching you how I do this on zoom. And the third level is I will teach you the back end of how you can monetize this. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, I mean, there's a great court, uh, Chris, Christian house, H O W E S, Chris house, great violinist, great human being, great class, still in contact with him. So, um, uh, come to find out they weren't interested in online lessons necessarily. And then I found out they were the new homesteaders. So what happened is <laughs> I left Florida after Easter in 21 and they also had, it was two sisters, their husbands, and their two kids each. And they were two pieces of property that came on the market. They were adjacent to each other at the same time. And they bought the entire 73-acre parcel. And wow. so now I'm homesteading, helping them with a the homestead garden. I go out there and teach lessons out there yesterday for three hours. You know, So that's another, that's, that's how the, the teaching goes here is that you go to a place where there's a family and you teach the entire family. So we have these family bands and family string quartets out here in the Ozarks that that are mainly homeschool students who have the time. And usually there's a parent that's a, a musician and they build a musical legacy in their teens and have a musical job uh, core that they can go out and freelance and make money, put themselves through college is what some of them did. So um, uh, so that's kind of how that happened. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I don't know. I lost thread of the question. Tell me again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, you know, that we're, we were talking just about, you know, whatever that energy is that calls you to a place and the purpose that yeah. it serves. Yeah. And it so sounds like kept calling me back. And so, so, yeah. so I went up, so I came back to, to it's called, um, hippie holler. Um, it's on another, it's on one of the pieces of property It's called the, uh, the stone pig because they have stone pigs erected at the entrance. So, um, 
they called me. And so I, I went up there and the week after Easter and they have tiny houses. So they have a little Airbnb at Hippie Aller. Okay. Plug for them. And um, so they let me stay in the high, tiny house. So I would get up and do garden stuff four to seven hours, take a shower, change hats and go teach violin lessons all evening and afternoon. At the same time, another guy contacted me and said, Hey, can you give me cello lessons out here? I said, sure. And then another person contacted me and said, Hey, I got a wedding up here. Can you play? Cause I used to play a lot. My, I do play a lot of weddings up here. And so it's like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to go. So I was running this triangle from Southwest Florida, 1300 miles to the Ozarks. Then I got a job at a winery in Western New York to the Finger Lakes, 1300 miles. Then I had gigs back and forth. So I was doing this 1300 mile triangle in each, each leg was for most of last spring and summer. And then a place came for sale here and more people were wanting me to move back. And so that sense of place um, returned and said, you know, we need you here. We want you here. There's opportunities here and we are supporting you here. And I, in turn, am supporting what and bringing knowledge and, and joy and whatever information uh, and to them. And so that's the exchange that um, has happened and uh, is very encouraging. Yeah, Fred, it sounds like you're definitely in the right place. Thank you for sharing so much of your insight on this. I think uh, I learned so much just from this real brief conversation with you. So thank you for hanging out with us in the Side Hustle Lounge. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, you're a great host. And um, keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you so much. And for those who are listening, if you'd like to connect with Fred, he makes himself totally available to you. Just visit the side hustle lounge.com forward slash VIP. Join the VIP room for free. I'll have links to all of Fred's websites for everything he's got going on, plus his email address in there. If you'd like to connect and talk about business coaching, garden coaching, or anything you may have heard on today's episode. Thanks, Fred. Thanks a lot, Bill. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to the Side Hustle Lounge podcast. You know, if you follow me on Instagram and social media, you already know that my pets play a huge role in my life, and I include them as part of the family. They are part of my why. Dexter and Violet bring so much joy and love into my life that I always want to make sure that they are well tended to and healthy. That's where my Toto pet insurance policy comes in. Toto was voted best pet insurance company in 2021 by Forbes advisor. And it's known as the pet insurance company with a heart and without the gotchas. There's no network of obscure vets that I'm forced to choose from. So I get to pick my pet's doctor. And then depending on the policy I select, I can be reimbursed up to 90% of the vet bill. And they make it easy to use. You visit any vet, you submit a claim, you get cash back. It's pet insurance finally done right. If you'd like to support the show, get coverage for your own fur babies and maybe even give yourself some peace of mind at the same time, Get an instant quote today on Toto's easy to use website at sidehustlelounge.com forward slash Toto. That's T-O-T-O.